So he starts it out this way. The fairy tale, a rich prince weds a beautiful damsel in an imposing castle surrounded by 600 excited guests and then departs in a horse-drawn carriage to the ecstatic cheers of thousands of adoring citizens, was perfectly choreographed by the Windsors. Hollywood could not have rivaled its authenticity. But... Few Kensington Palace staff approach that day without bruises and a tinge of disbelief about Meghan and Harry. And the family was really divided about this entire event. Now, Charles and the Queen felt like, thank God Harry's found somebody. And she seems like she's okay with being part of the royal family. And she seems like she's down for being a public person and she's not running from that. Because, as we recall, many of Harry's girlfriends had been really put off by having to be in the public and having to be followed and having to be watched and having to be photographed. And they ran for the hills. I think they ran for the hills because of who they were dating. But it was really easy to say it's because of all of the media and the media circus and they didn't like it. But I think we can all agree that Cressida probably had had her own fair share of attention. Wasn't she like a model? And she came from a pretty well-known family, so it's not like she was complete nobody. But regardless, they all wanted to say, you know, Harry's had such a hard time finding someone because, you know, he's just so famous. And here's somebody who is willing to be famous with him. But William and Kate had completely different feelings about it, and they were very skeptical of the success of this marriage and this wedding. And skeptical of the success of bringing in a woman in her late 30s who had been her own person and hadn't had to obey any orders of any kind and had gone through the world manipulating and playing games however I mean whatever the rules were she knew a cheat code to it and so they were just like "Ooh, but our whole life is run by rules and you cannot cheat your way through this one so how is she really going to do and as I was reading it I thought to myself I wonder if the older generation's approval of Megan and the younger generation's disapproval of Megan is based on the fact that there is such a generational divide in how people present themselves solely based on social media. So like the older generation may not have realized how diabolical some of these influencers can be because it's all based on let me make much of myself. I will do anything at any cost to progress my uh, my storyline and make you know, increase my followers. If that means I've got to call up folks and like beg to be allowed to stay in their hotel so that I can, um, I can, you know, stay in this lavish place. And then I'll say that, you know, all my followers will get, you know, we'll learn about the hotel. If you'll give me a free stay, I'll promote your hotel. Let me get free clothes. Let me do this. Like th this real low class behavior to continue to progress themselves in the world and put up this shiny picture of perfection. William and Kate, I think, may have been more aware of that narcissistic influencer culture and spotted it immediately in Meghan. Whereas I think that the king and the queen, or I think that Charles and the queen may not have realized what kind of personality they were working with. I'm not saying that they were stupid or that they were naive in any way, but it's like a whole new strand of personality mess that is shaping and molding our community and destroying the things that are good and beautiful because of this nasty low-class influencer thing that is like ruining everything and this is a complete and total sidebar but i'm gonna say it anyway because i think it fits i was listening to megan kelly the other day and she was talking about how um the met gala used to be an event to go to it used to be a-list celebrities beautiful clothes a lovely evening at a beautiful institution for a worthy cause right you had to pay a lot of money to go now it's full of people who you've never heard of. Like she was saying that she had been to this event once when it was fabulous. And then more recently when it was not fabulous and she's like in the bathroom and there's all the influencers like taking selfies and they've got their like cell phones out and they're like, you know, walking around like making TikToks and stuff. It's a bunch of TikTok stars you've never heard of, a bunch of influencers you've never, you'd never know. They're smoking in the bathroom. They're acting like just like a bunch of trash has just showed up and acting in their trashy ways. And it's just degrading everything that used to be wonderful. And I feel like Meghan Markle is very much part of this new influencer, trashy, I mean, she wasn't on TikTok, but you know what I'm talking about? Like these non-celebrities that are in our face all the time, just, they don't have any reason to be there. They've got no skills, they've got nothing. It's just, they know how to make like 30 second clip videos and we're all addicted to it. And so we know their face, but we really like for what? There's no acting skills. There's no art artistry. There's no beauty skill, up, nothing, no reason. And yet we're constantly fed this diet of reality TV stars. 
and this that these these low level no skill low class individuals who are not really all that they are presenting to be they just have a ton of handouts and they know anyway that's a tangent but i think william and catherine would have been a lot more apprised of that part of society than maybe the king and the and maybe the queen and charles were and so we're able to call out what they saw in a way that the older generation just maybe wasn't aware okay that was a long aside let's keep going um Now, like most families, on the eve of a wedding, okay, whatever your beef may be, the wedding's here, okay? The train ain't stopping now, so you might as well just enjoy the ride. So they're, they've are they let things go. Tom Bauer says that weddings symbolize the union of two families and their friends, and though that is what you would typically find, this guest list defied that convention. It reflected Harry's deliberate detachment from his past. Now, let us ask ourselves, why did he have to detach from his background? Why was that a prerequisite to his success with Meghan? You know, I mean, obviously, she didn't like any of his friends. We've covered that multiple times. And she didn't like um, the... She didn't like the culture of the upper class. And she let Harry know that his friends were um, un unacceptable to her and if he was going to stay in a relationship with her then he was going to have to ditch some of that upper british upper class culture that he had grown up in and as a middle finger to all that he said okay you're not coming to my wedding and he made it really clear i have i have new alliances now and it was extremely hurtful to people who'd always been in his life Several members of the royal family, cousins, uncles, and aunts, were surprised not to be invited. That's shocking to me. How could you exclude your actual family? I mean, it'd be one thing to exclude, you know, friends that she didn't like. I mean, even that, I think, is a complete and total overstep. These are his friends. They should come to his wedding. You know, he's in his mid-30s. He's finally getting married. Like, he, this is a big celebration. This is not, like, wedding number two for him. He should have been able to celebrate with as many people as he could get packed into that chapel. You know, it's a huge event for him. But no, she curated his side of the guest list too. Not just hers, but his also. Now, politicians were excluded, among them the Prime Minister and Donald Trump. Although scorned, he refused to criticize Meghan in a TV interview with Piers Morgan about Meghan's criticism of his misogyny. Well, I still hope they're happy, Trump said with unusual tact. But across the Shires, many who had helped Harry through his early years taught him to play polo, provided hospitality, taken him on safaris to Africa, and cared for him in the years after Diana's death, could not understand why they had been excluded. That is unbelievable to me. All these people who had st- stood in the gap for him as he suffered through the loss of his mother, in spare acts like nobody did anything for him, police, all of these families gathered and rallied around him to support him and his grief. And for him to now act like they didn't deserve to come to his wedding. And you guys also, what do you remember when we read Spare and that surrogate mother and father he had in Africa? He'd pick them up, he'd run into them somehow, and they were filmmakers in Africa. And like he would go down there and tell her all of his problems, his surrogate mom. And like he'd go, he'd run down there every time there was a problem and he would literally lay with his head in her lap as she like stroked his hair and he'd tell all the problems that he'd ever had. It seems like those people should have been invited to the wedding. Nope. They didn't get, they didn't get invited. It's weird that he makes so much of them in spare, yet couldn't offer to extend them an invitation. Well, it got to be so pervasive amongst his community of people who had not been invited that they had an acronym. NFI, not fucking invited. Individually, none could understand the snub until they came to a common conclusion. All were deemed to be of no use to Harry in the future. The guest list, strongly influenced by Meghan, ignored nostalgia and gratitude. The focus was completely and solely on their reinvention. So, lest we ever have any doubts that Meghan had planned to leave, like from day one, let us put those doubts aside. This guest list shows that she was trying to make much of her return to Hollywood. There's no other reason to invite all of these people. Half of these people, like, of no importance to her current life. It was just in an effort to dig in and make sure she hadn't lost her place in Hollywood so she could run right back to that when she needed it. And she was planning on needing it. Now, of course, the most 
notable exclusion from Megan's side of the guest list was her own dad and just like her own family. There was nobody from her family who came to this. Voicing the Queen's surprise, Charles was perplexed that besides Doria, not a single relative had been invited. How did Megan think she was going to get away with this and nobody was going to think, ding, 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 ding. That's weird. That's not normal. No one is going to think that this makes any sense or that you've got a, a valid excuse for not inviting people. It's going to look weird. It's going to detract from the day. It makes you look like you are some kind of scammer and schemer who can't let people from your past around lest they reveal all of your secrets, which is exactly what Samantha thought. But Megan, says her, uh, said Mike Markle, her 80-year-old uncle, has climbed socially and left us behind. And I think that's what happens when you're the underclass trying to rise above the reality of your situation. Listen to the wisdom of the ages speak. Yes, that's exactly what's happening here. She is trying to rise above the reality of her situation. The reality of her situation is that the people that she came from are very normal, regular, lower middle class Americans. And I think that there is absolutely zero shame in coming from a group of people that aren't the royal family. Who of us, uh, very few of us are running with the upper echelons of British society. There's no shame in that. And I think that if Meghan had chosen to show graciousness and kindness to her family, they probably would have acted out in less crazy ways, I think. I mean, I think that when she snubbed them, it kind of revealed maybe the rougher edges of their personality because they just wanted to be heard. And so they were going to claw and um, attack and, you know, strike first. And I think that had Megan just been a decent human being and been gracious, even if they weren't visually perfect or even if she wishes that they maybe didn't have so many bankruptcies and, you know, prison sentences in their past. I mean, it just seems like, yeah, I think the Markles were a little bit embarrassing to some degree. I'm not going to lie. Some of the things that they did, I mean, Tom Jr. did put a gun to his ex-wife's head. I mean, that is embarrassing behavior. And it would have been embarrassing to have family members that seemed like everything was always an issue. But she could have still... The whole world knew this was true about her family. But if she had still held her head up and thought, no, I'm going to be the bigger person, you don't have to invite every single person in the family. I mean, you could have left out Tyler and Dooley. All right, they don't know you. But what about just inviting just the core groups of your family, the people that you grew up with, you know, your your uncles who would arrange things for you so that you could continue to build your resume, you know, your dad, your mom, your half brother and sister and your uncles and your on both sides. No one is asking you to bring forward every single person you've ever met, but don't look like a weirdo with no family. All right. Well, the queen thought this was really weird and doesn't matter what she thought it, nobody was going to listen to her and all of Megan's family was left to the wayside except for Doria her uncle Mike Markle said that Megan was a prima donna because Thomas had treated her really well and now she thought that the whole world should bend over backwards for her because she'd never learned the word no of course, Samantha Markle weighed in, and she said that she believed her half-sister had excluded all the relatives to protect the lies that she had told Harry and others about her life, which I can only imagine is true because in any kind of casual conversation, you know, it could have just, any like, all, all manner of things could have been revealed, not purposely trying to betray Megan, but just, you know, they don't know what she has or hasn't told Harry. She tells every single guy that she's with that she didn't have a good childhood and that she had grown up really poor and she had family that didn't really care about her and that he was going to be the family she'd never had. So even on a very fundamental level, she's completely changing the story of her childhood. If she's going to tell a whopper like that and completely erase everything that her parents had fought and worked so hard for her so that she could have a really nice childhood that she, where she was very well provided for, I mean... If she's going to take an eraser to all of that, you can imagine that there's all kinds of other things that she's not only tried to erase, but added to her childhood. In their place, in the place of a real f family, 
Megan had invited her girlfriends and admirers. You guys, this guest list is so cold and uninteresting and just so bland and lacking any kind of nostalgia or joy or it's like why would you invite these people to celebrate with you who are these people okay so she'd invited her girlfriends and her admirers uh including john fitzpatrick her close friend from new york john fitzpatrick who you guys we all know we all raise our eyebrows to that he was escorting her around town that's what that whole situation was so for her to i mean i think that this is a very interesting term her admirers what does that mean you know what I'm saying? And I think that, you know, South Park got it right when he included all those hockey players in the congregation. Um, okay, so she had these admirers there, and God make it make sense, which why she would invite John Fitzpatrick to her wedding day. Okay, that's weird. Less noticeable, but more important, were those engaged to maintain her Hollywood profile. Her Los Angeles agents, lawyers, and publicity advisors... Um, Kaylee Thomas Morgan of Sunshine Sachs had a prime seat in the chapel, and behind them sat her fellow actors from Suits. Many had not been expecting an invitation. They all stayed together in this one hotel, and they all compared notes on the fact that none of them had been invited to the to the dinner that evening. I think that's really weird to invite people to your wedding, but then be like, you don't get to come to the actual party. You can just sit there through the really boring part that nobody cares about. I mean, that's just rude. I would never invite people and then be like, but not to the reception, though, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to go that far. <laughs> you might talk to people. Um, so she let them come, but only when they couldn't talk to anybody. And it's interesting that she would invite anybody from Suits because, I mean, what even is Suits compared to what she is now? But it's the last real work she had in that world. So she's got to maintain whatever ties she can there in case they might be able to help her later. Um, now... Tom Bauer is very fair in the sense that he reminds us embracing celebrities was not unusual for the Windsors, okay? I mean, they are famous themselves, so they're going to have some famous friends. And Charles had many times invited actors and writers for weekend parties in Sandringham. So it isn't like, oh, shock and awe, you've invited celebrities here. <laughs> Nobody does that. It's always, you know, it's just Ma and Pa and a couple of cousins, you know? Nobody's saying it has to be like that. But... It's weird that there was nobody meaningful at the wedding on Megan's side of the aisle. Uh, Tom Bauer even reminds us that Kate and William did include the head of Audi UK to their wedding in thanks for supplying his cars on generous terms. So to invite somebody to the wedding as a thank you for their bus for b business dealings wasn't, you know, out of the realm of appropriate. But it, like I said, it's just the level of celebrity and there was no reason why Megan or Harry should invite these people because they were not close. Why is Megan's family getting booted out so that George Clooney can take a seat? Among the stardust to seal the glamour of Harry and Megan's wedding were David and Victoria Beckham, James Corden, who would want that guy, Elton John, Serena Williams, and George and Amal Clooney. And no one even believed that Megan knew the Clooney's, but the palace insisted that one time Harry had met the actor. Okay, but that, you met an actor one time and then you're like, you got, you want to come to my wedding? <laughs> That's so dumb and lame and so like begging for attention. You'd kick your family out so that you can include an actor you don't know. And guys, George Clooney's grifter behavior is, it, oh, surprise me. Okay, you just wait till we you get to. I, I gotta tell you, I I have never had in my life a desire to join Hollywood or, you know, L. A. and all that crazy has never allured me. It just seemed like a crazy lifestyle full of shallow people. And, I mean, I'm sure that there are some thinkers and some doers and you know some really interesting, lovely people. Of course there are, but I've never been allured by that. Having read how much manipulation goes behind on behind the scenes and how much I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine and networking and, and, and how much false, like just, just how, uh, how guilted everything is and how falsely beautiful it is and how every diamond is really a piece of plastic. I just feel like grossed out by that industry on a whole nother level. And I thought that I had them firmly placed in my mind with, you know, distrusting them and just feeling like, you know, is this really an atmosphere that is conducive to human flourishing? 
But having sort of the veil pulled back on what I already knew was just kind of a scammy, weird environment. I would, I would, I never want, I, I mean, it's, it's not a threat. No one's inviting me to Hollywood. Say like one day I was invited. I would just be like, no, thank you. I will not. I don't want to have anything to do with you people. Uh, it's so fake. It's just, it's so fake. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to why I think George Clooney is just, gross okay anyway um among this surprising guest list oprah winfrey managed to, to get an invite and she's described this way in bauer's book renowned for turning wounds into wisdom as the television queen of victimhood oprah winfrey was an enormous surprise because she certainly wasn't megan's friend they had met for the first and only time two months earlier Okay, can you imagine you have a very limited amount of people who can come to this wedding? It's a si 600 people are at this wedding, okay? That's not very many people when you consider how famous the royal family is. So 600 people are invited to this wedding. And you waste an invitation on somebody that you met two months ago one time. Who in your life would you... And, and like, that's weird. I... If somebody invited me, me to their wedding and we had met one time two months ago and it was like a big wedding, I would be like, what? But why, though? Like, do you not have any real people to invite that you would ask me to come? Why am I getting an invite? You don't know me. And of course, I mean, it's so obvious why she did. I mean, it, again, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. Oprah saw it as an opportunity. So did Megan. It's just networking. But why use your special day to just network? And make it all about, like, your exterior life. Like, isn't your wedding supposed to be a celebration of intimacy and joy between the two of you? Not, like, how can I make this a business opportunity for me? And later on, when we talk about her speech that she gave at the dinner, Megan, do you realize this isn't a platform? This is your wedding day? Okay, well, um, both of them are just using each other uh, for a later date. We know that she was cultivating this relationship so that she could make much of it later on when she decided to betray everybody. Now, it it was very unusual that people were finding out about who the guests were on the day of the wedding. Because usually, the palace will publish the guest list. They've got no problem telling you who's coming. But this time, Meghan had vetoed that and vetoed it vehemently. Well, of course she did. She didn't want people speculating about how weird it was that nobody in her family was coming and that the only people coming were business lawyers and people from Sunshine Sachs and her old friends from Suits and a couple of people who could continue to help her and then a bunch of celebrities she had no business inviting. Of course she wanted to keep that under wraps. So for the longest, people had been playing, you know, guess who's going to the wedding by keeping eyes on social media. And a lot of people couldn't wait to advertise that they'd been invited, posting all sorts of things about what they were going to wear, what hotels they were going to stay at, their, what their journey like to St. George's Chapel was going to be like. I mean, it was all just everyone with their cell phones out. Just a really clunky, common sort of, this is the world we live in wedding event. Now, the exuberance for this wedding was high. Tens of thousands of people had come to line the streets outside of the chapel. And it's interesting to note the numbers when it comes to who was watching this. Now, in England, the numbers were 10 million for this particular wedding. For Kate's wedding, it had been 17.6 million. And Diana had gotten a whopping 28 million to watch her wedding. So it must have stung that she had the lowest number of viewers. Now, I don't think that that includes uh, American numbers. That's just in the UK. Because Bauer says, though she only got 10 million and it must have stung, she could, however, be sure that many uncounted millions were watching in America and elsewhere. Now, what was Thomas Markle doing? while this wedding is going on, this wedding that he was supposed to attend, but then had a heart attack and no longer could. Lying on a hotel bed to avoid prying journalists, Thomas Markle grumbled that he knew more of the Hollywood guests in the first two rows than his daughter did. Interestingly, he had filmed with them all, including George Clooney, in the sitcom Friends for Life. Um, and that was one of several reasons he came to believe why Megan had abandoned him in the months before the wedding. I mean, he would have been upstaging her as far as the conversations he would have been able to have with her guests who she didn't even know. He would have had all kinds of, hey, remember when we did this? Oh, that was really funny when blank happened. You know, it's like, 
how horrifying that she couldn't even talk to her guests, but that her fat, frumpy dad could. Of course, she was going to exclude him. Thomas had come to the conclusion that she never really wanted me there. And he felt that Doria was probably relieved about his absence as well. Speaking of Doria, you know, there she was wearing the clothes and with the demeanor that Megan had suggested and sitting alone. Megan hadn't even allowed her mother to bring a guest with her. Like, where was Doria's plus one? People assumed Doria had just wanted to come by herself, but that isn't the case. Megan had said, you can come, but you only you. Don't bring anybody. And that looked weird, too. Why is her mom sitting by herself? Are these people just islands unto themselves? Megan floating off somewhere, her mother floating off somewhere. Oh, they bumped into each other. Oh, I guess you can come, Mom. It's like, why don't these people have any real friends? Who, where... Why are these people so isolated? Everyone assumed that coming alone had been Doria's choice uh, rather than Megan's. Below Doria sat Kate and Camilla. Kate was inscrutable. Choosing to wear a traditional Alexander McQueen tailored coat she had worn on a previous engagement, she signaled that Megan should grasp that they were not rivals. Unlike Megan, Kate would eventually become the queen. And that's really interesting. I think what Tom Bauer means by this, and you guys tell me if you think that I'm right or if I'm just misreading that passage. Kate didn't have to go and become dressed, you know, to the nines in something that no one had ever seen her in and try to upstage the event by, oh, what is she going to wear, you know? And then everybody's talking about how she looks instead of the bride. Like Catherine knew that she could come in something she'd actually worn somewhere else. And that was completely fine. She wasn't in a rivalry with Megan. She didn't need to show up and try to take away attention from Megan. Now, we know that Megan, had the tables been turned, she would have tried to show up looking, you know, not just beautiful, but she would have tried to come looking sexy, so eyes would have been on her rather than on Catherine. Oh, goodness. I wish that we all had the class and grace and dignity that Catherine has. Now, the it's interesting to note that William and Harry, who were dressed in blues and royals, gave the firm impression of deep friendship and mutual support. And I do remember that. I, I remember thinking that they looked really happy and excited about the day, and they seemed very close. So I wouldn't have known at the time that there was any bad blood. Now, um, the queen arrives five minutes before the ceremony starts. Philip walked with her unaided. He was 96 years old, you guys. He just had hip surgery and he had a cracked rib. I mean, that man is made of steel. It's very interesting that they are seated and the visual was this. The royal family sat on one side facing Hollywood on the other. What a stunning visual that was. Because that is the reality of the situation. It's the royal family facing Hollywood, like a face-off. It's, like it's like an ancient battle where the two people come out on the fighting field and line up against each other. Now, as far as the service goes, they were looking at this as a great opportunity to show their desire for, for a multi-ethnic, multi-racial embracing from the royal family to all the Commonwealth, to all of the ethnicities that are now part of the fabric of London and beyond. And they saw this as a time to celebrate all that multiculturalism. So Charles and the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had, both of them had worked on this wedding ceremony together, and they had fashioned a celebration that would show Charles a strong relationship with Britain's Afro-Caribbean community. And the invitation to the Afro-American Episcopalian Bishop, Michael Curry of Chicago, to read a sermon and the inclusion of a performance by the 19-year-old cellist Sheku Kana Mason sent a message across the world that the British royal family sincerely embraced multiculturalism. They had had a very concerted effort to embrace Meghan's uh, black roots, I guess. And to show that they were, they didn't need to have this high church wedding in order for her to be part of their family. They, they had a gospel choir there. Okay, this is why I think that nobody, like people felt like it was a sham watching it. Because there was somebody in the comments the other day who said that they'd started watching it. And then they just kind of like couldn't finish it because it just was boring and dumb. And 
I agreed that when I was, I, I didn't finish watching it either because I remember thinking something feels off about this. And I think the thing that felt off about it was it felt like it was a representation of a person who had never existed. I didn't know a lot about Megan then. I, now I feel like I know way too much about this girl, but at the time I didn't. But everything that I had known about her thus far, it didn't seem like she, nothing I'd ever seen of her would show that she would have picked out a wedding with this Episcopalian minister. She wasn't Episcopalian. She was an Afro-American Episcopalian. She had gone to a Catholic high school. Um, it seemed like her experience with religion had been more like progressive Christianity and Catholicism mixed together. So it didn't, I mean, who was this Michael Curry that he had been invited? That seemed like just like, let's pick a black guy from America who preaches and we kind of know who he is. The gospel choir felt like it was, um, it felt like it was an homage to her American culture but it didn't necessarily seem like that was something that she probably didn't go home and listen to gospel records. You know what I mean? And then, I don't know, it just was like, like we have to get people who reflect her blackness, but nothing of her own life reflected that blackness. Like, just felt like it was a, like a false version of reality. And we were all supposed to be like, you know, oh, this is so great, even though it, it didn't jive with the reality that we knew. This is not the person that she was. It was a beautiful ceremony that was put together, but I feel like it was a sort of, um, the racial thing was forced, I think, a little bit. And it just didn't seem like it totally reflected who Megan was. But um, now, this is so interesting, and I so wish that Tom Bauer had given us a little bit more information on this. Okay, at the precise moment, set out on the timetable, Megan arrived at the chapel in a Rolls Royce. The same vehicle that had carried Wallace Simpson, the American divorcee, and the Duke of Windsor's wife to her husband's funeral in 1972. The officials had deliberately set out to give her this vehicle to travel in. More snubbing to Megan. Everyone was trying to get away with whatever they could to show her that we don't like you. Nobody felt like they were able to openly tell Megan we don't like you. So at every opportunity, whenever an official could do something that would show... You drive us crazy and we don't like you. They did. And when she stepped out of that limousine, the train on her dress got stuck. And the escorting officer who opened the door offered zero help. Fix it yourself. You're this strong feminist. Fix your own dress. The explanation foreshadowed what was to come. Because after her rudeness during the rehearsal the previous day, explained the officer, no one had any feelings of goodwill towards the bride. You guys, I'm telling you, Megan had made herself a pariah amongst the entire palace staff. Down to the guy driving the car, he wanted to have nothing to do with her. Fix your own dress. I'm not helping you. I wish we had gotten a whole chapter on what the previous rehearsal day had been like. That's the chapter that's missing from this book. So there she comes. She walks down the aisle. She walked halfway by herself. Then Charles met her and walked her up the rest. The, of course, she was touted uh, for being this feminist because she had dared to walk down an aisle by herself. Is this the world we live in where that is considered feminism to walk down an aisle on your own? Like, that's all it takes? What a feminist. She walked down that aisle unaided. Okay. Uh, well, she had to because she'd driven everyone else away, so... She had to get her father-in-law to give her away when he had exactly zero ability to do that. So, okay. Um, they get to the... Uh, they, he, he gets to the altar. You know, there they are, making eyes at each other, whispering their little words. Now, um, Tom Bauer has feelings about what he felt was just a racial performance the entire wedding. Um... He says Bishop Curry had been asked to speak for six minutes, but then, in Tom Bauer's words, in a barnstorming, unscripted 14-minute ser sermon, his exuberant appeals for the power in love, followed by a gospel choir singing Stand By Me, and some of the people in the audience didn't quite know how to react to the performance. Um, it aroused smiles among some and exasperation among others. It it's just a clash of cultures. It just wasn't what they're used to at St. George's Chapel. What I think about that is, okay, well, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a good thing to try something new, you know? And I think that it, what I think is that it would have been a really beautiful and powerful thing if any of this had been true to who Megan was. 
I think it would have been a really gorgeous ceremony if they had brought in other cultures expression of love for, for Christ and love for God. And, um, if they had shown the beauty and the diversity that is within the Christian church, that's awesome. And it would have been beautiful if they'd done that. It just, I think the reason that there was some exasperation and sort of bemused smiles is because people in that audience knew that it wasn't true to who Megan was. You know, what is this power and love and all this talk and stand by me and all this? It's just felt like more Meghan Markle performing. Not that the people who were doing the performing were fakes, but just it, it just felt like more of her circus to hide who she really was. And, and more of these platitudes and false words of assurance about the beauty and the mercy and the love. But it's like, yeah, but you don't ascribe to any of these things. So it's just annoying having this huge, big, over-the-top performance that extends past, doubles almost, the time allotted um, because it just feels like more sh more of the sham, more of the con is being is happening. I don't think people were like being racist in the fact that they were bemused by it. I think it was just, it felt fake. Again, not by the performers themselves, but by Megan accepting this as an extension of her personality. Um, anyway, doubts disappeared at the end of the service as Charles thoughtfully took the arm of uncertain Doria and escorted her out of the chapel. What a gentleman. What an absolute gentleman to do that. As Harry and Meghan emerged into the sunlight, the wedding was hailed as a triumph. A magically modern royal wedding was the Daily Mail's front page headline, echoing the resounding public acclaim. Universally, the ceremony was hailed as a perfect example of the monarch's deft modernization. No one doubted that the couple would be a benefit to the country and enhance the royal family. The monarchy's hope in William and Kate, a solid, loving modern family, and now Meghan and Harry, symbolizing Britain's confident entry into the 21st century. It could have been lovely. It could have been... People wanted it to be the beautiful picture that it, it seemed like it was. People celebrated, uh, and journalists and authors were only too eager to celebrate the potential new horizon that they were rising up to meet. One author, Tony Parsons, witnessed for The Sun the optimism among the crowds in Windsor. Standing on a packed pavement to watch Harry and Meghan pass by in an open Ascot Landau carriage, he recorded that the deep, bitter divisions inflicted on Britain by the EU referendum of 2016 seemed to have melted away. He wrote, here was a wedding to give us all reasons to be cheerful, and the joy was everywhere. Here was a royal wedding for the multiracial, multicultural country the UK has become. It seemed like a really great thing. And it should have been a really great thing. If Harry had united himself with a genuine person, it would have been. But unfortunately, he is marrying an operator, somebody who only cares about how to progress her own narrative. And she is so exceedingly narcissistic that there was no hope that this could ever be for anybody else's good except her own.